Today I've got a nice differential calculus problem that truly tests a person's understanding of a bunch of the rules from differential calculus. And so we'll see that along the way as we make the calculation. So what we'll start with is by defining a function f of x to be equal to the integral from 3 to x squared and then the integral from 0 to sine of y of the square root of 1 plus t squared dt dy. So already a lot of stuff is happening. We have an integral within an integral, and then each of these integrals have functions as the upper bound of integration. And so our final goal here is to find the second derivative of this function evaluated at negative pi. And our main tool will be the fundamental theorem of calculus part two, along with the product rule and the chain rule, which we won't recall on the board. So FTC part two says that if you take the derivative with respect to x of the function defined as the integral from a to x of g of t dt, then you simply get g evaluated at x. So g evaluated at that upper limit of integration. So in some ways, this derivative and integral cancel each other. And I'd like to point out that there should be some hypotheses on g, like continuity, for instance. But we won't worry about those as we recall this rule. But what we will do is sketch a proof of the fundamental theorem of calculus part two, just because I think it's a nice proof. And it's one of those that you might want to revisit every once in a while if you don't often teach a course in calculus because it's a good refresher on a couple of different techniques. So let's, like I say, take the derivative with respect to x of the integral from a to x of g of t dt. And here we'll use the limit definition of the derivative. So this is equal to the limit as h goes to 0 of, I'll write this as 1 over h times this function evaluated at x plus h which will be the integral from a to x plus h of g of t dt minus this integral just evaluated at x, which is, well, what we've been writing down. So we have something like that. But now from here, we'll notice that we're taking the integral from a to a x plus h, and we're subtracting the integral from a to x. So that'll leave us with simply the integral from x to x plus h. So in other words, we'll have the limit as h approaches 0 of 1 over h, and then the integral from, like I said, x to x plus h of g of t dt. And now from here, we're gonna use something called the mean value theorem for integrals. And you might say, well, if I'm not proving the mean value theorem for integrals, then should I really use that? And you know, there's a kind of a question of how far do you wanna go back into proving kind of our basic results. And I think for the purposes of this problem, it's okay just to use the mean value theorem for integrals. So MVT for integrals says the following that this integral, which I've boxed in pink, is equal to h times g of c, where c is some number between x and x plus h. Great. Okay, so now let's see what that leaves us with. So notice this h right here will cancel this h right here, and we'll be left with the limit as h goes to 0 of g evaluated at c, which you might say is just g evaluated at c. But notice c has a variable component to it. And that's because c comes from this interval, interval between x and x plus h. So if we're letting h approach 0, then that means that c must approach x because we squeeze this interval until it's just like a singleton. So that'll leave us with g of x just as needed. So now that we've got this taken care of, let's go to our main problem. So our main goal is to find the second derivative evaluated at the square root of pi of our crazily defined function. Well, we probably want to take the first derivative first. So let's do that. So the derivative with respect to x will be applying this fundamental theorem of calculus part two be equal to the integral from zero to the sine of x squared and then the square root of one plus t squared dt, but that's not quite it. We also have to multiply by the derivative of the inside function. We wanna view this as a composition. So that'll be multiplied by two x. 
So let's make sure that we see what's going on here. So we're taking x, inserting it into the function. So that would be set. So here that would be taking this upper bound, inserting it into the function. But this inner function is a function of y, so we'll put it right here. But then, like I said, we want to think about this as a composition. So we're composing x squared into a function like this. But by the chain rule, that means we need to multiply by the derivative of x squared, which is 2x. Okay, so we're good to go here. Now from here, we'll take the second derivative. We have to use the product rule as well as the chain rule for this. So the product rule will have us take the derivative of 2x first. So that'll give us 2. And then we'll have the integral from 0 to sine of x squared of 1 plus t squared dt. And then we have to add that to 2x times the derivative of this other bit, which again, we have to use FTC part 2 and chain rule. So let's see, we'll have 2x, and then we have to plug in sine x squared into the square root of 1 plus t squared. So that'll give us 1 plus sine squared of x squared. Okay, so that's good. Then, like I said, we have to take the derivative of the inside function. In this case, the inside function is sine x squared. So that'll give us cosine x squared times 2x. Again, by using the chain rule within the chain rule. Okay, so now let's rewrite this. Maybe we'll combine some things over there. We'll have the integral from 0. This is still sine of x squared, the square root of 1 plus t squared dt. And then we'll have plus 4x squared times cosine of x squared, the square root of 1 plus sine squared of x squared. Great. Now we're ready to evaluate this at the square root of pi. So let's do that. So f double prime evaluated at the square root of pi. So this first bit will give us the integral from 0 to sine of pi, but that's also 0. The integral from 0 to 0 is 0, so that's gone. And then here we'll have 4 times the square root of pi squared, so that'll be 4 pi. Then we'll have cosine of pi. Well, that's negative 1. So that means we have a minus 1 here. And then we'll have 1 plus sine squared of pi. But sine squared of pi is 0. So we'll have the square root of 1. So that doesn't add anything. So in the end, we have the value of our derivative at the square root of pi is negative 4 pi. And that's a good place to stop. Mm -hmm.